Hi, welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath. I am Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Today I'm going to make looking into epigenetics and epigenetics aid reversal a rather personal experience. You know, what is my motivation here? What is my focus? And I'd like to share you where I've been, um, where we are now, and where we're going to, to show you that you can do this for yourself as well. As always, all that I do is about having you take advantage, take control, take responsibility of your own health in actionable information, right? That's my part is giving actionable information. This is a larger piece of actionable information that needs a larger explanation, but let's get to it. Making epigenetics personal, why anti-aging doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but it really should, part one, setting the stage. Why you need to know what epigenetic anti-aging is and how to test yourself, which you now can do, and you couldn't do it even a year ago, and I'm sure it's gonna get even more refined in the subsequent years. For that, we need to reveal a larger context, both historically and a little bit on health, and using some non-human examples. We need to do this to show you why, you're te- why you should test yourself periodically, along with other labs, right? This is my focus. And by doing so, it may well change your life completely. Okay, so when we talk about, oh, we gotta test yourself, people go, why do I need to test myself? Why do I need to do this test? Why do I need to do any test is really the question we're talking about. Because it's important to have data, actual data, I know we didn't have labs 100 years ago or more for the most part, and life went on, but we need data to be human-centered, data-driven in our health orientation is really a necessity today, absolutely a necessity today. So because data is important in maintaining your health today, we must gather relevant data labs and look for patterns that we can address especially when things aren't going very well for us. So yes, in a mechanistic way, in this analogy only, it is like taking your car in. Why do you take your car in? And some of you I know don't take yourself in to the shop, to a doctor, to just get reviewed, get some lab work done. Now, part of my whole emphasis here is you can get your own testing done. You don't need a doctor. Start basic and learn about yourself. This is ultimately your responsibility. That's my gig here, folks. So that's what I'm saying here. So now when you go and get your car fixed, not only do they look under the hood, now there's an analogy, but they wheel up this whole big cart, which is a computer. That's like getting labs done for you. They wheel up the cart, they hook it up to all these different things, and each one does something different, hooking it and unhooking it and so on and so forth, and they get a report. And it's from the report, in addition to what they can see by looking under the hood, they go, hmm, um, these are the things that are most important that we need to address. Or maybe, hey, it's running fine. Check. You're good. Okay, my focus is driven by two questions. What makes a queen bee different from a worker bee? That was the surprise. And two, why do the wheels come off the car, metaphorically speaking, when our health suddenly falls apart. Huh? Okay then. Think about this, next slide, when you wonder how relevant epigenetics could be for you as part of the data collecting you might consider doing. All right then, queen bee versus a worker bee. Maybe you know this, and maybe you don't. I find it fascinating every time I have to review this part of the story. So queen bee is five times larger than a worker bee. Queen bee over here actually is a worker bee that has a different set of genes silenced, turned off, silenced by a difference in diet. This dietary change from the worker bee's diet to the queen bee's diet extends the life of a queen bee up to five years, whereas a worker bee lives for 40 days. That's amazing. Same set of genes, different diet, tremendously different outcome. And this is a whole species built around how you can differentiate, hey, that's the queen bee diet and that's the worker bee diet. Right when they're in the pupa stage, when they have the worker bees feeding, nope, nope, that that, that goes to the worker bee. That goes, you know, you don't do that to the queen bee. And there's only like five or eight queen bees that are fed something different. And then 
they narrow it down to one. So diet makes a difference. With bees, makes a difference with us. Okay, this is epigenetics at its purest form. The question is, is this about methylation, turning genes off, or is this about demethylations of specific genes? What makes a queen bee? Royal jelly, which is called, and you're going to say, ah, it's royal jelly. Brace yourself. Royal jelly, which is called bee milk, looks like white snot. <laughs> More than half of it is water. The rest is a combination of protein and sugar. Special glands in the head of worker bees secrete the stuff which gets fed to its babies. A developing queen bee is fed royal jelly exclusively, not pollen and not honey like her proletariat sisters. Some describe withholding royal jelly from worker bees as, a nutrition, as nutritional castration. These bees don't get the special foods of the gods or perhaps food of the genetic monarchies. And so we thought of their ovaries and so we thought their ovaries shrivel. They become non-functional in terms of reproductive purposes, and they don't become a queen. It turns out, it's the other way around, not feeding an immature queen pollen and honey is what makes her royal, not her exclusive access to royal jelly. It still presents it. Some genes are silenced, and some genes aren't by di differential diets. Radically different looking animals created from identical genetic material. Absolutely. A worker bee and a queen differ only in which genes are activated. Genes make proteins, which build the rest of the bodies, which makes the difference. By manipulating the environment of their offspring, honeybees genetically alter their bodies via nutrition. Now are you thinking, can humans genetically offer, alter their bodies via nutrition? What do you think my answer is? Okay then, 14 genes known to be involved in the worker queen differentiation were upregulated or increased in expression. So that means the royal jelly or the lack of the honey in the pollen turned on some genes. The silencing of the genes. By using the environmental ingredients, honeybees found a clever solution to a challenging problem. How to generate two contrasting organisms one long-lived reproductive queens, and short-lived, functionally sterile workers using the same genetic hardware. So which is it? Methylation or demethylation of specific genes? What makes a queen bee, or doesn't make a worker bee? Have you ever thought you were born for something more than what you are? Maybe it's not too far of a stretch of the imagination to say that you methylate some genes, or you unmethylate some genes, and you will have a transition. I think it's exactly that. I think it's exact, exactly that on a lot of levels. Biochemical, molecular, emotional, spiritual. You can do a lot with this particular metaphor or conversation. There's a queen bee inside of all of us, I have no doubt. It's just feeding our genes what they were meant to have. And this may seem like a bit of a fantasal or a, um, a bit facetious thing to say, but it's not. When you think about today's nutrition in the United States, back to this chronic disease rates, up to 60% of the entire population when it wasn't that way in 1935, under it was 7.5%. Huge. Why is that? You might say we're not being fed the diet that's going to make us queen bees or king bees, if you will. We are kept with a different diet, which is processed foods and all the other ills processed food represents and see the previous videos I've done on the omega-6 catastrophe and so on. But this is it. If you bring it down to, are you going to be a queen bee or are you going to be a worker bee? And it's all about that diet. Think of the food that you're eating. Are you eating as a worker bee, which is Doritos? Or are you eating as a queen bee, which is steak, fish, non-organic, Vegetables. Okay, reestablishing a healthy methylation pattern, turning things on or turning things off. Is it really just a question of that? Turning on some genes and turning off other genes? This is the study that we've been following for the last three or four videos, and this is their summary. You know, it says the question to ask is we're looking, this is all their data. So, of 18 people here, eight men from mid 40s to early 70s 
8 out of 18 got younger, 9 stayed about the same, and 1 got older. Hope he got paid twice. But why the difference between the group that got younger and the group that had no change and that one that got worse? The probable answer is their need. Who had the greater need for what this program offered? Most likely, it comes down to their genomic need. And I say that in part because that's been my uh, intuition, because I do a lot of genomic work for clients and patients. But also, that's the overlap. Not everybody needs the same thing. Not everybody needs the same genes turned on or turned off. Okay, the goal of this study was to create a health, healthy methylation pattern, which means the ability to say you knew what genes needed to be turned off and you kept them off. You knew what genes needed to be up and running and uh, replaced when they were worn out, but active, absolutely active, and keeping those two sets exactly correct. And as you change, the sets changed, of course, in various parts of the body, but you had control over who was on and who was off. You start losing that ability to methylate or not methylate, and it starts to get crazy. Loss of that control is, by definition, aging. This is what the epidemiological clock measures, is certain parts of all genes, many genes, lots of genes, and seeing how appropriately if they're methylated or not methylated. So my other question was, sometimes in one life, um, one's health completely falls apart in the middle of the road, and all we can do is barely crawl to get out of the way. This happened to us, and feel free to look into what I consider the Gold Camp story. I'll put that up here. Um, this happened to us. Our tires did come off our car, off, a off our lives, off our health lives. But it woke me up to asking better questions about our health. I began a quest to find out more relevant answers to help me better understand why our health just disappeared. Rock bottom. Both my wife and myself were sick at the same time. We're talking about sick with a high chance of death happening in both situations at the same time for various different, different reasons. Unbelievable. So um, to both be sick at the same time was a little overwhelming for both of us. And there's a picture of Judy's second operation and me waiting for my four pints of uh, blood transfusion. What's that story about? Here's the summary. For me, it was a lot of stress. Our medical practices, deaths in our family, and so on. And so I was, I was diagnosed by colonoscopy with severe Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and in 90 days, if things didn't get better on steroids that they gave me, I was gonna have to have my bowel resected, removed, trimmed, to just cut out the inflamed parts. And then you go on a colostomy bag for the most part. Okay, well, that didn't happen, spoiler alert, but so what happened? First of all, my experience was when you're that sick, you can't defend yourself. Learn to be a patient again, huh? So on steroids, you know, I, my, my blood pressure was high, I was anemic, I was puffy all the time, and uh, it just wasn't working out, and that was not the thing to give me. So finally, after the getting the first of four blood transfusions over two, two days, a few months later, um, these are four transfusions they gave me. You can't give somebody four transfusions at one point, it has to be two and two, so four pints of blood. So uh, just to give you a reference, in your body you have about just under five pints of blood, to make sense. I have lost four. I was less than one pint of blood. So you wonder how can life exist? Um, your body adapts. Um, I was surprised it was just kept on getting worse and worse. Anyway, there's a whole video on that so you can go into the details if you're interested. My initial goal was I wanted to save my bowel from getting resected. So I started small, save your life. Okay, so I went from bad to worse. And when you're that poor, you're not gonna question the care you're given. But the primary thing is they were making their mistakes on me. They gave me steroids and the story was, my history was definitely about stress. And so consequently, if you give steroids, which is a stress hormone for a condition that was caused by a stress, you're only gonna make that situation worse. And they made it far worse, far worse. It was time to research my way out of the situation, but where to start? So for Judy, my wife, she had been complaining of headaches for the last three or four years. She was losing vision in her right eye. And we're not quite sure why it happened other than stress as well. We bought a whole new medical uh, practice and a whole new medical building. And so after work, we were 
painting and stripping and doing things as much as we possibly could, but we were living in those fumes, little did we know. So each year we would see a retinal ophthalmologist who basically said, um, gosh, it was all in her head. Can you imagine that? Finally, in the third year, he ordered an MRI, which we were advocating for in the first year. And that showed that there was a tumor uh, right under her pituitary that was cutting off, impinging upon her optic nerve and call it, causing her to lose vision, which she did lose vision in her right eye, and it's still obviously gone. Uh, but it was the size of a small plum. So lesson there is, if you think your truth is not what you're getting from your doctor, go find another doctor. You do not have time to have that guy figure out what the right answer is. That's it. As much as you think you're being nice and you're tired, you need to have somebody advocate for your health. So that's what it looked like. The impingement on her optic nerve right under the bulb of the pituitary, and it was driving up her growth hormone. At this point, by the way, you think that um, I took her to a number of doctors, some of my naturopathic doctors that I had a lot of respect for that practiced oh, well over a decade more, and then they found that she had elevated IGF, um, insulin-like growth factor, which is a growth hormone in essence. They're thinking, wow, you should be healthy. That's a good thing. No, it's because the tumor was impinging upon her pituitary, and that was causing the increase, but they couldn't figure that out. Had, they, they were even more clueless than the ophthalmologist. So... Again, pay attention to your intuition. The Calvary wasn't coming to save us. That was pretty clear. So diving into epigenetics became part of our quest to rescue ourselves. And it was clearly, rescue yourselves. My question was, how did we come to know what we know about epigenetics today? I wasn't going to trust somebody to say, hey, take this test and it's going to change your life. You know, now I needed to do the research behind the possible suggestions that other were, others were going to make to us. Okay, I covered part of this last time is to continue a little bit on the history of the epigenetic timeline. Last three videos, we covered the Dutch hunger winter and the siege of Stalingrad and um, the overcalyx and why that was important in setting the stage for understanding even more. We're going to go a little further this time to Dr. To Dr. Randy Yurdy's, Yurdel's work, which is pretty stunning. Listen to this. So enter the work of Dr. Randy Yertel. He's up the road at Duke from 2003 to 2007. Meet the Agouti Mouse. It is genetically designed. You have to buy these. So you, you have to buy these mice. They're, they've been, after generation after generation, they are perfectly programmed to be large, obese, yellow, and highly prone to cancer. So this is what they use to experiment on, especially if you're studying um, Diabe uh, uh, ob obesity or diabetic. So they're large, obese, diabetic, yellow, pr pretty, you know, you can see it visually as there's a difference, both by size and color. So what did he do? So he took from large, obese, diabetic, yellow mice prone to cancer to normal colored, healthy mice. And the question is, is this a parlor trick? Did he really do this? And nobody believed it. So he did it again. A greedy mouse. What did he do? He had two sets of mice. They were about to have litters, right? So they grew up on chow, but in one group of these goody mice, right? Big, fat, obese, diabetic, prone to cancer mice, he gave them methyl donors, kind of B vitamins, but B12, folate, acetylmethionine, choline, trimethylglycine, otherwise known as beta-ene. So we call those methyl donors. And poof, what happened? All the pups, as they're called, all the pups, and the litters ended up being normal, healthy mice. That was dramatic. That was dramatic. And so with no more than a change in diet, the methyl donors plus the chow, they ate the same chow, laboratory goody mice were pr prompted to give birth to young, healthy, uh, differentially marked by in appearance by the disease, uh, appearance and disease susceptibility. They were healthy. So this happened in 2003. It was all over the world. He repeated the parlor trick, um, and others have done it as well. So it is pretty solid that it can be done. And he went on from there. We're going to pick it up next time from this point because I want you to understand and appreciate both where we're coming from as a teller of the story and why this is relevant to your situation, whatever that may be. Till next time. Bye-bye. 
Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp again. You know, I just wanted to say, if you're interested in the topic of epigenetics, you may well want to start here and go through some of the videos we did on this. I think it's a profound new tool that we all can use. So until next time, take care.